Welcome to another episode of the Gyrolab Spin video podcast. My name is Rob Durham. And my name is John Chappell. And today's topic is uh, talking about uh, assay troubleshooting. In today's discussion on assay troubleshooting, we want to give Gyrolab users some key tips and tricks for mitigating common problems that you might see when you're doing assay development on the Gyrolab system. So today, the topics we really want to cover are the common causes of poor assay performance, testing for and minimizing carryover, and identifying instrument issues. So what I've tried to do here is list some of the common causes of poor assay performance. Of course, number one on the list for me is poor quality reagents. I, I know that I've uh, encountered a number of situations where somebody wants to do a, an evaluation of our technology and oftentimes they'll give me an assay that uh, they say they haven't been able to make work on any platform. <laughs> That's very common. <laughs> and so when I see that, I think, well, why hasn't it worked on any platform? And usually the, the answer is they don't have very good reagents. Uh, so again, using high quality reagents that with where you've confirmed the affinity and the selectivity is going to give you the best chance for success. So in our system as well, uh, labeling uh, can be complicated uh, because we do need to biotinylate the capture reagent and uh, put some sort of a fluorescent tag on the detection reagent. And so over labeling can really impact uh, performance of the assay. And uh, we talked a bit about uh, aggregates of the detection reagent when we were having the discussion last time about the viewer profile. And so, so that's an issue that we want to mitigate as well. Inappropriate buffer or uh, diluent or wash solutions. So uh, in our system, we uh, have a lot of methods that utilize uh, dual needle wash. So it uses a stringent wash buffer. Uh, and we'll talk about uh, how that can mitigate carryover later in today's discussion, but uh, using the appropriate wash solutions to clean the needles and also uh, the appropriate diluent for diluting your samples. Yeah, I, I think the choice of diluent is, is so important for analyte to stop. I think it's better to solve a problem with a Rexip diluent than it is by trying to overclean the instrument sometimes. Yeah, I think, you know, it's just like uh, if you uh, use the right diluent, you prevent the needles from getting contaminated in the first place. And so exactly. I think of it as always a two-step process where you're, where you're picking the correct diluent for your samples and then, if necessary, using the appropriate cleaning. Uh, we do depend on the, that wash station cleaning the needles, and one of the common problems that we see is if the wash station is uh, not functioning properly, we're going to see carryover and problems like that. Uh, so poor maintenance of the wash station in particular, and in general, poor maintenance of the instrument. Yeah, I mean, our, our instrument functions very well when it's maintained well. Yeah. So it doesn't require the end user to, to really follow the user guide in terms of daily monthly maintenance because a, a clean machine generally works well. Yeah, uh, and where we've seen folks who are very diligent about the cleaning, and it's not that burdensome, I don't think, uh, no. it, compared to other systems that I've had to maintain in the past, it's uh, relatively straightforward. Mm -hmm. A few minutes every day will uh, lend itself to a really strong uh, instrument performance over uh, the long haul. I mean, it's common with all automated immunoassay platforms. Uh, you know, they all have maintenance procedures, and and you know, following the maintenance is is the key to getting good performance. Yeah, and I think we have several tools that you can use. We'll we'll go through some. Uh, things that you want to do in terms of a visual inspection of the instrument. We also have a functionality test kit that can uh, assess instrument function in ways that's challenging to inspect from a visual uh, perspective. And then instrument errors can occur. Uh, we uh, can do a regular PM visit by your service engineer. will help mitigate some of those kind of problems with pumps uh, acting up or um, valves that uh, go or syringes that go out and so those can be uh, issues that uh, happen occasionally and uh, having a regular PM where all the, those equipment those pieces get swapped out is very helpful as well. When you fully automate an amino assay carryover can be an issue 
Uh, that's because um, the, there's, there's need of transfer of the samples. So it is important that that carryover is assessed. In most cases, it's not going to be a problem, but it is important that we look at carryover, not just in development, but also the, any impact, particularly when you're doing more and more runs on the instrument. So, I mean, the carryover can be minimised by the choosing the appropriate diluent, as, as we previously mentioned. Um, Rob, do you have any comment? Yeah, well, I think uh, in addition to that, one of the things you want to keep in mind is that, the, you know, we're pushing for greater and greater sensitivity. And, and uh, people often look at very broad dynamic ranges. So when you push to very high sensitivity assays, you're going to exacerbate the problem of detecting small carryover. If the, the needles aren't absolutely clean uh, in between transfers, it can lead to this problem of, uh, of seeing a little bit of residual sample left on the needles. So again, using the right wash buffer uh, can help make sure that the needles are clean as well. We have two wash methods that help uh, mitigate the problem. Yeah, and that's the, the second wash buffer, it's, uh, pH 11 is normally used as a second wash buffer yeah. to minimize carryover. Absolutely. So here's an example of what we mean when we say carryover. Uh, you see here a standard curve where we have very high analyte concentrations. And then as the as the analyte concentrations come down, we see this apparent uh, increase in signal on the bottom three points of the curve. This is a, a 12 point curve where we have a blank and 11 points on the standard curve. And so what you have to know is the way the needles are, yeah. are used. So in this case, the blank is going to be needle one. And then three, five, and seven are the top three points on the curve. And then it's going to use needles two, four, six, and eight to pick up the next four points on the curve. And, and so the last four points on the curve will reuse needle one, and then three, five, and seven, and again. And so what you see here is there's some residual analyte left on the needle because those three needles last touched the top three points on our curve. So this is a handy way to do two things at once. You can sort of extend the analytical range of your assay and then also uh, determine if you've got a carryover problem that you're going to want to uh, get at. Yeah, I think, I mean, this really does show how uh, carryover can be very easily tested yeah. as, as, part of the, as part of the development. Right, and, and so I think one of the other things that I'll run into occasionally is someone will say, well, why don't you just put the uh, reverse the order in which you pipette things onto the plate, start with a high and go to low, um, or, or start, start with rather low and then go to high rather than high to low. And, and, and you can do that, but the carryover is still there. You're just you hiding it. You're not seeing it. Yeah, so. exactly. <laughs> so you don't want to you don't want to hide it. You want to be uh, be sure and see it early and fix the problem so that you don't get this over recovery with your QC samples. So when you're thinking about doing carryover testing, uh, there's a couple of different standard ways. We talked briefly about the 12 point standard curve uh, just a moment ago. Uh, you can also do a blank high blank where you'll challenge the uh, eight, eight, all eight needles with a with a uh, high concentration of analyte and then test whether you see any carryover afterwards. Um, one of the recommendations we have in our carryover method testing though is to always do a needle desorb before a carryover test. This may not be as big of an issue anymore because uh, in the more recent two wash methods there's a sort of a mini desorb that's included as the, at the beginning at the end of every run. Yeah that's very true. And, and that's really designed to sort of make sure that if you have a sticky analyte it doesn't carry over to a problem in a in a different assay especially if you have a generic uh, assay that you're running for IgG or something like or, that. Or you're running multiple methods on the same instrument at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So so it's designed to mitigate that. So, uh, you know, use your best judgment, but you may not always need to do a needle desorb before. So here we'll give you a little bit more detail on how to do this 12-point curve carryover test. 
if you're using the driver lab control with a wizard design uh, this is where you input your standard points and of course we're going to do blank plus 11 standard points in this uh, setup and you want to organize your samples from high concentration to low concentration when you do this you can see on the right hand side what the gyro lab control loading list looks like and what i've done is added a little column out to the outside here which uh, details which needles are going to be used to handle each of those samples so as we said earlier going into well a1 will be needle one and it'll follow three five seven to pick up the first four wells and then wells five six seven and eight will be picked up by needles two four six and eight those will get transferred to the surface of the cd the wash program will be engaged and then it'll reuse needles one three five seven for the bottom points of the curve so essentially what we've done is we've challenged needles one three five and seven uh, three five and seven are going to get challenged with a high level of analyte and then the lowest three points on the curve will be your your last uh, two yeah, and, and please contact your FAS to get uh, the carryover test uh, method if you don't have it available. Yeah, and I think uh, you, you can easily set this up, but I mean, uh, you want to be sure you have an adequate two-wash method uh, that will uh, help use uh, appropriate washing solutions. And I think the other thing that, again, I want to reiterate here is that what you select to dilute these samples in will have a big impact on whether it's going to stick in the needle yeah, in the, the first the place. Yeah, the diluent is very important. Yeah, I, I always think of it as a two-step process. So here again are the results of our carryover test when we have carryover. And again, you can see those three points that I've circled at the bottom of the curve, at the low end of the curve, are uh, falling on a different uh, line, actually. And so that suggests that we're getting over-recovery. And uh, that over-recovery is likely due to the fact we've contaminated the needles and haven't cleaned them thoroughly. One of the other points I'll make about this particular example is that we've actually got the top three or four points on this curve are at the maximum. We're not getting any additional benefit from those. So John, maybe comment on, you know, you know, if you're not, if you're just simply contaminating the instrument with excess analyte, maybe one of the things you could do is actually truncate the curve because these three points yeah. or four points at the top here aren't buying anything. No, exactly. I mean, your analytical range should should be based on, on the results you're expecting in your sample. So there's yeah. no point going really high and plateau in the curve because yeah. um, as, as, this is obviously going to increase the chances of carryover. Yeah, the more sensitive your assay, the more problematic it could be with carryover. If you really needed those top three points on the curve, you could shift to a different CD type, shift from yeah. a, if this is a 1,000 nanoliter CD, shift to the 200 or the 20, and you'll likely get... Um, the top more of the top points to come in for you or you could increase your your dilution uh, your mrd yeah. as well yeah, uh, absolutely to desensitize the assay yeah, absolutely so again this is this is a way that you can really easily test the carryover early in your method development at the same time as you're doing um, analytical range testing So in this slide, we've laid out how to do the blank high blank carryover test, the alternative way uh, to, to test for carryover. In this case, uh, you can set this up in manager uh, by uh, changing the plate position of, of the, the standard plates. Normally, you would put the standard curve in A, uh, blank in A1 and high to low. In this case, we're going to move uh, the standards to the B row. And we'll have eight blanks in row A, eight high concentration um, across C, and then blanks or an LLOQ uh, in D. What we've also indicated here is that we're going to do things in replicates of three. This will really help highlight when you see a between replicates problem. If there's some sort of a pattern, you're seeing a low, medium, high, high, medium, low. If you see that sort of stair step pattern, it will indicate if you've got a problem with the diluent uh, that you're using for your samples as well. So Rob, do you have any recommendation when we should use this blank high blank carryover test compared to the normal standard carryover test? Yeah, I think uh, typically you can see the problem quite nicely with the 12 point curve. As we said, that's a quick way to do that. This is really more formal testing, I suppose. 
I've had folks that are working in a more validated space where they will do this as a formal test. Or if you had a number of different diluents or second wash solutions that you wanted to test in a more robust way, then this is one way to do it. I can show in the next slide uh, what the data looks like for this one. So from that blank high blank test, your blanks before and your blanks after are shown in this uh, curve where we see the raw response from needles one through eight. And uh, the dark uh, teal colored is the blank before and the bright green is the blank after. And the question you wanna ask yourself isn't what the, dif what the difference is, but is the difference between those two meaningful? Uh, these are all relatively close to one another and sometimes we'll do a ratio of the two. So if you're close to one, you know that you're, you're not getting significant carryover. But the, part of the reason I, I bring this up is because we'll want to know uh, in terms of uh, that response whether it's relevant. So in, a, in your standard curve, if that returns, if that higher response in the blank after returns a value that you would measure in your assay, well, then you've got a problem that you have to deal with. Uh, oftentimes, the, having the LLOQ as that last, instead of the blanks after, will run LLOQ, and you'd want to be sure that your LLOQ passes uh, your acceptance criteria without any sort of over-recovery, and you're getting good uh, between replicates uh, uh, variability as well. So as we've said um, during this talk that there's two steps to doing the solving the carryover problem uh, first is to pick the right uh, buffer uh, so for preclinical uh, bioprocess applications you probably use the rexip a family of buffers rexip an or an max if you have positively charged analytes and if you have a hydrophobic analyte you might use rexip f has a little higher detergent if you're working in a clinical setting, you'll probably be using the uh, H family of buffers. There, uh, HN uh, or HN max will be the selection if you've got a between replicates problem and you want to fix that with a higher um, a salt concentration. Um, and then Rexip F is also suitable for that. And I would also say that you can use Rexip HX is another one of our buffers that has a little higher detergent concentration. So Rob, I was just going to mention now that we now do a scouting kit, which is a kind of a, um, a selection of Rexit buffers that allows uh, the end user to, to actually test all the buffers and see yeah, which that, was best. For that's a really great ad. We've been asking for that for a while. So it's great that the product team has gotten on that and launched a scouting kit. So if you're interested in testing a, a, a variety of buffers in your particular application, you can use that scouting kit as a relatively cost-effective way to get um, access to several different buffers to try. So the second uh, step in doing carryover is to, is to pick a second wash solution. Now early on when, uh, when I was a customer we fixed carryover problems by having the second needle wash and we would develop a custom second wash solution yeah, for every here, analyte. Yeah, yeah. And, and, uh, and so that was pretty time consuming and we got to the place where we said it would be great if we had a good broad spectrum uh, solution for carryover and, and that's where the pH 11 wash buffer comes in. This is a detergent uh, that you know, we sell in a vial and you can make a liter of it at a time. Uh, it's a relatively convenient way to, to uh, have a solution that will fix a broad spectrum of carryover problems. Yeah, it works very well for most analytes. I think so. And uh, there's a second choice here, which is one of the older solutions that we had that was pretty successful. This is a 50, 50 millimolar glycine at pH 9.5 with 0.5% SDS. That's a, 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 an alternative that works almost as well as pH 11. There's uh, several sticky cytokine analytes for which pH 11 is clearly superior. Um, and then 0.5% SDS and 20% ethanol also have uh, used that successfully for really hydrophobic analytes. Uh, what's not here because it's problematic is we've used the one and a half molar salt, sodium chloride uh, in 20% ethanol before. 
that is uh, useful, but again, that will really clog up the needles yeah. in the wash station if you're not careful with it. So uh, that's that's probably why it's not uh, recommended so again, anymore. Again, ma maintenance is very important, and really. Yeah, I, yeah. I think anytime you're you're dealing with uh, sticky analytes, you want to be sure the needles are getting cleaned for your for your needle for the robustness of your ass uh, many assays on the system. But you'll also want to be sure that. Um, um, you're not having any um, contamination of the wash station or um, problems with the wash station doing its function either. And uh, one other thing I wanted to point out here too is that in addition to choosing the right buffer, choosing the right second wash solution, you may want to think about adjusting the assay range. It's sort of a you know uh, alternative way to sort of you don't if you're hitting the system with huge levels of analyte, you may run into a situation where you've uh, contaminated your instrument unnecessarily if it's not pr providing you any analytical benefit. So this is an example of the efficacy of pH 11. Here you can see uh, we've got two different analytes, IP10 and VEGF. And what we've done is the ratio of the blank before to the blank after. And so if it were at one, this the, the, it's the same. So if you have a very high level after, then the ratio goes uh, above one. And you can see here for VEGF, it's quite sticky. And so with PBST, for example, we have a problem for both IP10 and uh, VEGF. Using the 50 millimolar glycine or the SDS uh, will... Um, help with uh, um, IP10 a little bit, but we still have a bit of a carryover problem there. And certainly uh, the 50 millimolar, or I'm sorry, the 0.5% um, SDS in ethanol doesn't really work very well for VEGF. The high salt in ethanol, as I mentioned before, is is works okay for the both analytes, but then what you see with the pH 11 is we're at par uh, for both. It really cleans up the system nicely. Um, one thing I will mention here is that uh, there's a chlorine component in pH 11, and because of that will um, dissipate over time when it's exposed to air and light. And just like your swimming pool, you need to add chlorine periodically to keep the um, concentration sufficient. Um, here we would just recommend that you uh, expire the pH 11 at the end of a five-day week. Yeah, I think most customers these days are using pH 11 as standard as a second wash. Yeah. So it's not not whether they have carryover or not, they, they effectively yeah. add it because yeah. it's good housekeeping to, to include it as part of your assay. Yeah, and I think I think the key there is if you still see observe some sort of a carryover, then be sure you've done your due diligence with testing the right assay diluent. Yeah, will maybe fix a uh, carryover problem if you still have any residual carryover. So here in this third section, we want to uh, look at is the instrument functioning correctly and how can you determine if your instrument is functioning. I think one of the first things I'll do is uh, do a uh, visual inspection of the instrument. Uh, here is an example for an older instrument. For those of you who don't, who have an old XP system, you'll recognize down here in the middle panel uh, this uh, box with all of the peak tubes coming in and out of it is our external degasser and uh, the things you want to check here visually is is it turned on number one i've had customers that uh, turn it off and then forget to turn it back on before the beginning of a run and then you want to be sure that none of these peak tubes are either broken or kinked because that will imp impede uh, liquid flow uh, through the hydraulic lines into the pumps and uh, if they're broken or kinked, of course, you're going to get an error message or a failure for transfers of two needles, since it was, one pump is connected to two different needles. Uh, the other thing here, I've got the picture of the robot uh, dispensing on the surface of the, the CD and the left lower image. And there, you're, what I wanted to iterate is uh, or talk about is, is um, if you see any droplets of buffer on the surface of the deck or anywhere it shouldn't be, 
on the surface of the CD when you look at the CD at the conclusion of a run, that may indicate that there's something gone wrong with your liquid dispenser. But we have had in the past uh, uh, some examples where the needles would get hung up in the casing and then you'd see droplets of buffer on the deck in places where you wouldn't expect to see buffer. Buffer should only be dispensed, picked up from the plate and dispensed on the surface of the CD. If you see droplets anywhere else, then it's a problem. The other thing I've got here is in the lower right image is a look at the pump. So this is the syringe pump and on top you see a valve. The valve has got two positions, an odd position and an even. So each uh, syringe pump delivers uh, uh, aspirates and dispense function for uh, an odd and an even uh, needle. So this is, if this is pump one, that would uh, serve needles one and two, uh, etc. So again, you want to be sure there's nothing leaking out of this. The syringe is in, is, uh, there's no bubbles in the syringe when it's doing the uh, aspirate dispense functions during a prime, and you're not seeing buffer uh, leak or salt below the, the syringe would indicate that you might have a bit of a leak. If you see salt build up there, it may not nece uh, necessarily mean that your system is, is uh, non-functional, but it's something you want to address uh, over time. Uh, in the upper right hand corner, another great visual check is to look at your plate when it comes out of the uh, assay. If you see that one or more of the wells that you think should have been pierced were not pierced in your assay, that may be an indication that there's a problem with the needle uh, addressing the plate correctly and um, taking sample out of the well. I've never seen anybody put their plate upside down. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's <laughs> right. Yeah, no, um, but uh, but the, but the needle, if it doesn't pierce the pierce yeah. the well, obviously you know that. And and you mentioned the other uh, earlier about um, uh, if if you have a problem where you um, either didn't put enough, we didn't put enough buffer in the plate, or uh, you can look at the uh, wash buffers on there, and you should see in the wells at, at least 20 uh, microliters in each of those wells at the end. Now, you know if you've got four wells of a wash buffer, and and uh, the fourth well may have more than 20 microliters because it might not have used the whole. Because we always specifies in increments of 100 microliters per well. So. So if it's used three of the wells and gone into the fourth one, the first three wells should have 20 microliters. I mean, a visual check of the liquid volumes before and after run is always a good thing to yeah, do anyway. Yeah, I, I always check to make sure there isn't bubbles in the bottom of the yeah. well. And, and we've also had folks spin plates to get rid of those bubbles. But again, you want to do that cautiously because if you create a pellet in the bottom of the well then that's going to create those block columns that we talked about on the viewer profiles um, podcast uh, last here on the upper left corner is an image of the gyro lab functionality check if you look at the um, uh, in the maintenance tab you can see there's a place for uh, needles and when you look there you'll see an opportunity to run a gyro lab functionality check this is just a 20 minute test which uh, can really test whether the laser is uh, calibrated to the CD correctly and whether or not you're getting low and high volume transfers uh, within sufficient uh, specifications for the CD. And it's a very useful test. I, mean, I know a lot of customers are, are using this routinely, either monthly or weekly, just to show the functionality of the instrument. And I know the engineers obviously use this test and we use it when for troubleshooting if there is any issues yeah. with the instrument. Right, if you have any questions about the functionality of your instrument, having that gyro lab functionality test on hand is an easy, quick thing to do. It only takes 20 minutes. So this is what the test looks like. It you know, really verifies the instrument performance by uh, testing liquid transfer and the detection module and software database connection as well as foil penetration, needle wash and spin detection. All those are tests. Uh, tested and uh, if you get a pass you're confident that the instrument is ready for use. So again uh, to summarize here there are several tools to support troubleshooting. We've talked a bit about the Jarvalive functionality check kit. We've uh, 
in the previous podcast, we talked a lot about viewer and interpreting viewer profiles, which is a very handy uh, function of the system. Uh, the carryover tests that we've talked about today. And then within your evaluator report, you can overlay curves, identify the needle ID, and uh, use that to, to help troubleshoot uh, various um, analytical problems you might encounter when you're running the assays. So that brings us to the end of our time again today. Uh, thanks so much for your attention. And as always, uh, we'd love to hear feedback from you. If you've got any comments or questions or would like to hear about other things, uh, we'd, we'd be happy to hear um, your, your feedback. Yeah, please don't hesitate to contact us. It would be great to, to get feedback on anything that you would like us to work on or anything that you would like us to talk about because we're, we're here to, you know, to provide as much information as possible. All right. Until next time. Thank you very much, everyone.